on reaching scale and access to energy. Today, in part one of the series, we will focus on entering the next frontier markets, overcoming challenges for solar success beyond peri-urban areas of East Africa and India. The webinar is brought to you by the Inclusive Business Action Network, IBAN, ISTRA, and the Practitioner Hub for Inclusive Business. My name is Marcus Dietrich, and I'm responsible for policy and private sector at IBAN the global platform promoting inclusive business through knowledge and research, partnership and networking, as well as policy dialogues. Now you know who I am, let us know who you are. For this, I'd like to ask you to quickly answer this poll. Tell us about you. Do you work for a solar company, private sector company, NGO, financial institution, government donor, research academic or others. There we go. So still 10 more to go. Let us know who you are and where you're from. So counting down five, four, two, three, one. So the majority is from the private sector. Uh, and uh, we've got a couple of solar companies as well, NGOs, government and donors. Welcome, welcome very much. So we can switch off the poll now and we can get started. Um, the basis of this webinar series is the report by Hystra, you can see here. Reaching Scale and Access to Energy was sponsored by IBAN, ADB, Responsibility, Schneider Electric, SDC, Total, and USAID. And I'm very happy to have one of the authors, Francois Lepicar, Network Partner at Hystra, as well as representatives from two organizations which form part of the research, Ron Margalit, Principal, Blended and Impact Investment at Lumos, Maurice Kent from the USAID Global Development on today's call to provide you with more insights into the findings of the report, as well as give you opportunity to ask questions later. Let me now give our panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves. Francois, please start. Become a partner in Hystra. Hystra is a consultancy dedicated to support the private sector in promoting market-based solutions to social problems. It was founded in early 2009 by Olivier Kaiser, formerly head of Ashoka for France and UK. I'm also the one who directed the work on access to energy, access to energy being a field on which uh, I've been involved, I've been following uh, since uh, 2009. Um, that's it for me. Over to you, Maurice, is it? Uh, Ron first. Ron first, sorry. Um. Thank you very much and uh, happy to share our thoughts with uh, everyone who logged in. Uh, my name is Ron Morgalit, uh, leading the effort within Lumus for blended uh, and impact investments, uh, mostly around innovation financing, which is obviously uh, probably the number one challenge uh, in, in scaling. Uh, if uh, those of you who are not familiar with Lumus, um, uh, Marcus, maybe we'll show the first uh, slide. Uh, Lumos is a pay-as-you-go solar home system company uh, operating mostly in West Africa. Uh, our core market is Nigeria. Do we have the slide, Marcus? Uh, anyway, um, we can do without it. Um, so as I said, solar home system company on a pay-as-you-go operating out of Nigeria. Uh, started last year, have deployed more than 50,000 solar home systems. Our solar system uh, consists of an 81 panel, so it's uh, on the larger side of uh, solar home systems. Uh, allows you to meet the top three wish list of a rural off-grid uh, community or household, which is light your home, charge your phone at night, and run a fan to cool. Um, and we service mostly homes, households, uh, but also have about 25% of our clients as uh, SMEs. Oh, thank you very much, Ron. Um, now going to Maurice. 
Good morning, uh, where I am. Good, mor uh, good, mor good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Maurice Kent. I work for USAID, uh, and I'm a program officer on the Scaling Awkward Energy Grand Challenge team uh, in the Global Development Lab. The Grand Challenge is a partnership that's about a year old um, between the lab, Power Africa uh, at USAID, and uh, TIFID, Shell Foundation, and uh, AFDB. Uh, and basically, it's a collaborative investment platform uh, for around at least $100 million um, looking at working together to accelerate uh, off-grid energy markets and specifically focused on solar home systems uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And so uh, we're about a year old. There's a document that just went up. It's like our year in review if you want to learn more about the Grand Challenge. But uh, if you go to the next slide, um, our uh, strategy is basically focused on three areas. So uh, looking at helping solar home system companies grow uh, and accelerate into new markets. So that's through direct uh, investments and grants, um, looking at uh, improving demand. So finding ways to uh, enhance value adding appliances and other devices Maurice, you're back on again. I'm back. Uh, anyways, um, so looking at improving demand for solar home systems and then finally doing some market enhancement and acceleration work uh, in some key markets, specifically Uganda and Nigeria. Oh, thank you so much, Maurice. Um, and um, I look forward to, uh, to exploring the issue of scaling solar lanterns and home systems beyond the current hotspots of East Africa and India with you and the participants at this call in the next hour. Uh, we'll first hear from Francois about the insights gained from his research on the topic of scaling. Francois will then lead the discussion with our panelists. After about 45 minutes, we will open the floor to your questions, which you can type into the chat box throughout the webinar. Please feel free to address questions to one of the panelists or the complete panel. Uh, my panelists have agreed to respond to questions we could not tackle in the webinar on a best effort basis afterwards. Uh, but before we hear from the experts, uh, we like to listen to the collective wisdom of the participants and hear from you what you think the top three actions to scale access to energy are. You see now the list in front of you, and I'd like to ask you to fill in quickly the poll. What is the most important for the success of solar companies at the base of the pyramid? So after sales support, brand awareness, distribution strategy, ease of payment, price, product aesthetic, product quality, or a wide range of solar products. So, oh, this is almost as exciting as the uh, upcoming German elections this Sunday. Uh, let's see whether, although I doubt we will get a 63% uh, uh, figure in that election, but here we do. Um, there's a clear favorite emerging. Um, so I'm counting down now. Five, four, two, one. That's it. Okay. Uh, we've got a clear favorite uh, distribution strategy, uh, followed by ease of payment, price, and product quality. So that's interesting. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this insight. Uh, and um, let's now hand over to Francois to share his insight and whether he agrees with your assessment. Francois, over to you. I, I'd be happy actually to, uh, to keep the results on the poll or on the, on the side if it's possible, so I can, we can actually comment on it uh, afterwards. Um, the, uh, the, the, the report was, uh, uh, is a follow-up to our work in 2009 on access to energy, and this time it was focused on trying to understand why a technology that's been around for 20 years, because uh, Grameen Shakti actually started to uh, install SHS based on solar in 1997, um, uh, hasn't been able to uh, reach uh, more people than, uh, than, has, than has been done. And uh, uh, true to our mission of, you know, uh, being the voice or, or, or the good of the private sector, what we did is we asked practitioners uh, what was limiting their growth. 
So we did uh, 26 case studies on companies offering lanterns, SHSs, cook stoves, water pumps, mini grid services, and they told us what's holding back their growth. Um, and this is what we are, uh, that's what this is, uh, I mean, the distribution part is, uh, is uh, what we're gonna focus on uh, in the next uh, 50 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the um, this is the state of the market today. As you can see uh, on the on the left side, you have the breakdown of uh, global solar product sales for all uh, certified lanterns, or, and um, for all all lanterns that are being monitored by Gogla. And then this is the breakdown of uh, population uh, without access to electricity. And you see a very clear 70-30 uh, uh, breakdown. So most of the cells are in East Africa, uh, namely uh, essentially five countries, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and, and uh, to uh, almost exactly the equal volume in India. Uh, but uh, most of the people who don't have access to electricity are in the rest of the world. If you, if you actually want to dig further into this, you look into Kenya. Next slide, uh, Ron. Uh, next slide, sorry, uh, Marcus. Uh, if you look into Kenya, this is even more striking. Uh, Kenya uh, is the country where, relative to population, most solar devices have been uh, distributed. However, when, as I did, you walk down the, the countryside in, in uh, in northern and, and uh, northeastern Kenya, uh, down the central track, you see still see very, very, very few lights. And then uh, if you actually go into the home, the few homes who have a light and you, are, you ask to see what they've got, they've got a, a, a either a very, very cheap uh, Chinese-based device or a, a sort of... Uh, uh, makeup SHS with a battery that's uh, clearly beyond its age, a solar panel and a, and a, and a few uh, LED lights. So why did the three million uh, lanterns that were, where, where did the three million lanterns sold in Kenya go? Because obviously they were not in the countryside. Well, they essentially went uh, around uh, Nairobi and Mombasa uh, and uh, in the suburban areas of, of the larger cities. And, uh, and the 70% of the rural, rural population is actually having no access uh, to those products. Uh, this, is, this is what led us to look at the frontier markets. So frontier markets here are really two different markets. Uh, the, the, the very remote areas, rural areas where the time lost accessing it makes it unprofitable for the traditional direct sales agent model to actually uh, push through sales. And uh, those markets like Nigeria, which face a number of holdalls, uh, but essentially have a, a one, one for the purpose of this um, webinar, have one big issue is that there are partially electrified markets and the density of the households without access make the discovery process of clients far too costly. Um, and this is what led us to uh, formulate uh, sort of, you know, six, uh, sorry, five uh, propositions for tweaking the traditional uh, access to energy business model. One is distribute, I will comment further on each of these one because we'll go through each of these ones. One, distribute products which are field resilient, i.e. that will uh, be attractive uh, to people living in more remote areas. Two, identify and use sales aggregators. This is exactly uh, the, the point to your distribution strategy. Uh, three, price the reach. And that's a tricky one because, of course, it's going to be extremely tactical. Four, develop alternative payment solutions. Uh, you know, even in Kenya, where supposedly 90% of the people are equipped with uh, mobile money, uh, in practice, uh, it's not being used. 
So uh, relying essentially on mobile money for payments is uh, is uh, certainly uh, a, a sure receipt to be absolutely concentrated on suburban areas. And five, outsource logistics and customer care. However, we believe that in some areas that are really remote, uh, where the density of potential customers is really low, that will probably not be enough and we'll try to talk about alternative solutions. Um, so this is, this is it for the introduction. So let me, uh, let me start with the first point. Um, going back to, uh, Going back to my, you know, central track in my rural village in Kenya, uh, when you ask people, uh, when you ask people why they have they haven't got uh, quality products and why they didn't invest in a, in a in a full bloom SHS, uh, they, they'll they'll point you to three things. The first one, they'll point you to the lantern that is a, that is a rusting in the backyard, whether it's not being used properly or whether it's broken down but nobody w came back to take it back from them and uh, and they're stuck with it so next time comes somebody comes up with an expensive product they're very 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 careful uh, about spending a lot of money on something they can't use the second thing they will they will let you know is that uh, the the way they haven't been offered the opportunity to actually buy one and when they have, it's from a guy coming from far away that they'd known that they wouldn't see him again ever. And uh, clearly, um, they don't trust this guy to uh, you know, abide by the guarantees that he's pitching or stand for responsibility for the product uh, that he's trying to sell. So even if they are offered this thing, even and although they, they desperately need it, they probably won't buy it because they've been caught a few times in the past through, I don't know, pumps that uh, broke down after a year and, and they invested in crops that went down and so on and so forth. So the, the trust building is a big issue, which means that the prod, most of the products that are today certified are not adequate uh, for, um, for rural use. Not adequate uh, because uh, usage is not always self-explanatory, but especially not adequate because the level of quality, i.e. The, 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 the probability that your product is going to break, break down needs to be much slower than it is in areas where you can have somebody traveling around and picking up the slack uh, when, when it's necessary. So, uh, uh, you know, fine-tuning the right product that will not disappoint people based on the usage they want with a, with a very high level of quality is, uh, is uh, the first key issue that you need to uh, uh, address when, uh, when you want to go for the more difficult to reach market. I think Ron, you you have a. I mean, Lumos has a, has a, a, a strong experience in fine tuning products. Do you want to do you want to share on this, Ron? Sure. Um, so uh, we actually uh, took into consideration most of the aspects uh, that were highlighted in the uh, uh, the Google. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Hystra, uh report when we started the company. Um, and we really took in, in, in consideration both what people really need. Uh, this was back in 2012, so most interventions were out, access to electricity focused around uh, providing lights, but we felt that um, people would actually want more. It's an aspirational sector. Um, and also in ways of how to go to market. Uh, we felt that as a young company, we still see ourselves as a young company, we don't have any competitive advantage in building complex distribution channels. Uh, so this is the reason both to our larger system, uh, which obviously costs more to manufacture, but eventually will allow people to get what they want in terms of uh, usage, um, as well as in terms of the distribution um, and the fact that we've decided not to build our own distribution channels, but rather partner with mobile operators that have proven the capability of leapfrogging from a landline-based utility-type 
model to a mobile uh, service uh, where Lumus is responsible for financing manufacturing the system um, and servicing the electricity and the mobile operators are in charge of the distribution, the marketing, the sales, and then even the after-sales uh, first-tier uh, customer support. Uh, Maurice, do you want to uh, comment on that? I mean, I, I, I believe that you are, I mean, USA is, USAID is actually uh, working on product innovation. Sure. Uh, in terms of the solar home systems themselves, the companies that we work with uh, recognize that the quality of their products is really a major strength um, compared to devices that uh, aren't quite as uh, long lasting or field resilient, as you put it. Um, and so making sure that quality control is put in place uh, at a number of checkpoints, not just at manufacturer, but also, you know, prior to going out to the customer, uh, that those are in place. Um, there's also a great focus on uh, the battery as really a key component. So the, the LEDs and the other hardware um, is, you know, uh, pretty much uh, where it can be in terms of being resilient to uh, environmental damage, but the battery and making products actually able to uh, endure and serve out as long as possible is really important. Um, but uh, beyond actual product resilience, I think there's a little bit of emphasis on virtual resilience as well. Um, so using warranties and other guarantees to make sure that uh, customers, if in case of product failure, that they can get a new product as quickly as possible and as easily as possible um, is in there. We have one grantee that really focuses on maintenance maintenance, and uh, not on product production or anything like that. So they're a distributor solely and only focus on uh, the distribution and maintenance of those products to make sure that they're uh, up as, as much as possible. And as a donor, we do try to track um, or at least monitor and understand what the product downtime rates are for the various companies we're working with. Uh, but yeah, definitely this is a focus for uh, a lot of the partners that we have. Okay, I'll move on next now. I'll move on to uh, number two, identify and use sales aggregators, which is uh, exactly to the point of the public on the audience on, on the distribution strategy. Um, as, as you correctly identified, uh, the traditional agent model of you know visiting and, and selling to individuals uh, will actually not pay for itself in uh, rural areas or in low uh, low density areas uh, low customer density areas uh, which is the case for partially electrified areas uh, what that means is that uh, although it's a best practice for agents to uh, develop a network of referrals that will uh, bring up sales um, it is actually you need actually to go further for these areas going further means identifying somebody who will um, uh, you know pulling a page from the from the mfi book we will actually aggregate responsibility for for buying the products and uh, and selling bulk this is clearly what uh, lumos did uh, with mtn or at least to some extent Alternatives exist uh, with, uh, you know, religious congregations, cooperatives, schools. In Senegal, Ulu recruits village chiefs, village chiefs to to through uh, giving them a system and giving them commissions on additional sales. There are many ways to uh, build sales aggregation. Each of these way, however, needs very careful preparation and discussion on what the your aggregator is actually able to do and not to do and how we'll deliver. But I think Ron's experience with MTN is a, is a very good illustration of, of how, how much work in preparation of cell aggregation is, is required. Yeah, absolutely. And this is uh, the challenges that you've outlined are specifically the reason why we felt that uh, the fastest, most scalable way to go to market would be to partner with those who prove and how to do it. Uh, the telco. So MTN Nigeria is uh, the largest uh, telecommunication uh, company uh, in the country with more than 50% market share and about uh, 50 million 
uh, subscriber base. Um, and the partnerships we have with them, as I've mentioned uh, briefly before, um, when, if you are a off-grid Bluetooth customer in Nigeria, all you need to do is to walk to one of the 1,000 point of sales MTN has across the country uh, that are relevant to carry a Lumos product. They have many, many more. Not all of them are necessarily relevant uh, in terms of inventory and logistics uh, consideration, but over 1,000 of MTN stores, and you can just pick up uh, um, a kit. Uh, it's a do-it-yourself IKEA style. Take it back home, install it relatively easy, uh, and you're good to go. Um, our systems are sophisticated in the sense that they are all uh, managed remotely, um, both in terms of testing, maintenance, but also in terms of communicating with the system and with the customer, thus allowing us to uh, reach the scale and even the uh, most rural areas within Nigeria. And if we will have time uh, later, I can show you a quick map of it. Uh, we have uh, products that are sometimes 400 kilometers away from the nearest MTN store, uh, which proves that if you have a better quality product at an affordable price and it is readily available, it will find its way to people's homes. Maurice, do you wish to comment on this? Sure. Uh, Ron's point about uh, using telcos uh, and other kind of major partners as distribution points is really great. Uh, and we've seen that in uh, many other countries as well. Um, I think beyond that, um, using, we've seen companies that uh, don't necessarily have those large partnerships with major organizations still use existing networks of um, possibly uh, <clears throat> Uh, MFI agents to also sell their products, um, stores, shops, anywhere where customers congregate, um, making sure that they target those um, kind of existing distributors as sales agents. Um, and then understanding how to balance um, sales and commissions for their agents is really important in terms of making sure that although agents are aggregating <clears throat> and gathering more and more customers that they're getting the right customers. And so um, expansion of sales is important uh, for a lot of these companies, but making sure that they're doing it sustainably is really key. Uh, and so you, you don't necessarily want to find as many customers as possible uh, through as many agents as possible, but you want to make sure that you're finding customers that can actually pay for the product. Uh, yeah. So I'll leave it there. Right. The next point, price to reach, is a, is a tricky one. Um, what you're selling when you're selling access to energy we are actually, is actually selling an experience. So what you're selling is customer satisfaction, not a device. Um, and uh, people in rural areas especially are perfectly aware of the fact that uh, going to the city to get a solar lantern or, or a small SHS, bringing it back, and, uh, and, uh, and setting it up oneself is actually, uh, uh, is actually a big investment uh, and uh, not having to do that has value. So if you're, if you're, able, to, um, if you're able to actually deliver the goods and you can be convinced of delivering the goods, you can clearly uh, claim uh, a higher price than you would claim in the suburban area in Nairobi or in Delhi. Um, uh, the the other thing, uh, of course, uh, that price is only going to be accepted if your solution is credible, uh, which is always a bit of a tricky issue, which needs that you have local relays, hence the sales aggregator mentioned before above. But that being said, uh, significantly higher margins, like you know, at least ten percent more, is probably what's required to reach uh, remote areas. And, uh, and uh, we contend that people are actually ready to pay for that extra 10%. Um, I, I don't know uh, that anybody's experimented with uh, tactical pricing. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Lumos doesn't. Am I, am I wrong, Ron? No, you're not wrong. Okay. Uh, I, actually, I actually think nobody does it. Um, uh, however, uh, this is this is something that should be clearly looked into, uh, especially if you lose third-party use third-party distributors. 
uh, Boris, I don't know if you want to comment on this. I, I believe, uh, do you want to comment on this, on, on tactical pricing? Uh, no, not so much on tactical pricing, yeah. um, just that uh, we have seen a lot of innovation in terms of additional services that mm. companies offer um, yeah. to, uh, you know, make the if, the, if the end of the day, like gross price um, seems relatively high compared to mm. other products, um, to make the daily spend uh, or monthly spend that a customer is putting into the system worth it. And so, you know, other additional devices, TVs, fans, uh, refrigerators, um, those are all fantastic kind of value adds that companies can add. But we've also seen really interesting additives like free health insurance um, and hospital insurance uh, to go with their products um, as well that really make uh, the value clear. And then, you know, warranties, good call center and customer service, um, all of those things are a critical part of pricing and making sure that although, you know, at the end of the day, you're paying for a, a premium product that uh, it's worth it in the end. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the other thing is that, the, you know, the battle with generic products on affordability is a losing one. They don't pay for marketing, they don't pay for distribution. There's no way, uh, there's no way quality product companies are gonna be able to fight that. And when people pay very low, very low amount for, for a product, they expect very low service. Uh, I think if, if we're talking, yeah, go if ahead. If we're talking about size, obviously, um, obviously there are many considerations to take into account. Um, the basic premise, uh, at least in our case, is that the comparable cost of everything related to the energy servicing that you are providing with the alternative um, should be on par. Uh, yeah. And when you look, and I'll be the first one to admit, Nigeria is not like the rest of the continent, uh, but being the largest off-grid market in the continent, when you take into consideration not only the generators that most households have, yeah. um, the fuel, the servicing, maintenance, but also the fact that they need to pay to what, what they need to pay to charge their phone, accessories, et cetera, um, then you can price it. If you price it on, a, on, on par with what they're already spending, uh, they would be willing um, happily to do so. Um, I think yeah. another key aspect, which may relate to the tactical pricing point that you've mentioned, uh, it's very different. And again, we at Lumos do things a little differently, but price adjustments, not just for uh, affordability, but also to combat with foreign risk, uh, foreign currency risk and fluctuation, price flexibility is definitely something that is very important um, as you scale um, from the hubs to the rural and to other markets. Um, and, and this is something that, that we have uh, uh, somewhat experienced with. Right. Uh, okay, point four, uh, that's a quicker one probably, develop alternative payment solutions. As I was saying, mobile payment is not an option in many areas. Uh, other systems exist, such as scratch cards that Simpa is using, for instance, or uh, a more innovative, again, uh, taking a, a leaf from the MFI uh, cookbook, is uh, pay group payments. So you sell, you know, 10 solutions to, uh, to a village, and they have a solidarity in uh, paying for the solution uh, if, uh, on credit, uh, which is, again, what uh, Maragao Power is using for their... Uh, nano grids. Um, I I I won't comment further on this, uh, Ron. I think you have a couple of things to say on payment solutions. Uh, just to just to echo what you said, mobile money is not available uh, yeah. in most countries in the continent, um, and the reason we have decided to invest heavily in our early days in R and D to allow ourselves to link with the mobile operator airtime billing uh, systems, uh, which is not easy uh, yeah. from a technical standpoint. I think proves itself uh, um, as we grow in, in, um, in West Africa. And I think airtime allows you 100% of the addressable market. Uh, it's not to say that we cannot use mobile money. Uh, from a technical perspective, it's much easier. Uh, but everyone has phones and everybody uses airtime. And the same process that someone is already familiar with top-ups either to 
download a ringtone or uh, a data bundle. Now they can do it through uh, and, and download, if you will, an energy bundle. And, and this is the reason why we've decided uh, uh, to go that route. Uh, just to say, to, to reinforce, reemphasize the point on, on uh, mobile money, Kenya is probably the market most advanced in the use of, of mobile money because uh, M-Pesa has been there for a very long time. 90% of people have a, a, a mobile wallet uh, in Kenya. But uh, if you look at the actual number of payments, you're the average user makes four transactions per year. What this means that you know, 10% of the population is actually using mobile money, and 90% of the population is not using it, and that's Kenya. Maurice, do you wish to comment on this? Sure. Um, I think we've seen a lot of innovation here um, from our partners, and we are greatly interested as a donor in seeing how Pago uh, and Household Solar can drive mobile money use for other things, not just for the systems themselves. Um, so we've seen partners uh, in Ghana, for example, where there's not a um, specific uh, mobile money provider that everyone uses or two or three, um, find success using uh, basically a pre-programmed code um, through an SSD string uh, that customers can program into and it, it basically works the process for them on their phone uh, relatively rapidly uh, to send funds. Uh, this company also has uh, the opportunity for customers to pay via their call center um, so they can uh, customers can call into the company, they'll talk to a uh, person on the phone who will then walk them through the process and basically execute the payment uh, for them while they're on the phone. And so these things are basically ways to make mobile money easier to access for customers who aren't used to it um, and find ways to bridge between like actual functional mobile money systems that everyone is comfortable with and uh, cash. Great. Next, uh, outsource logistics and customer care. Uh, this is uh, this is probably the most, I would say, theoretical at this stage. I've 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 come across only one example. Um, uh, but basically, uh, ele economics of direct distribution systems just don't hold in low density areas. Uh, even if retailers make the effort to make maintain a local distribution. Uh, uh, which will have to translate into prices, they lack the credibility in staying power or powers. They, I mean, your average, again, again, your average Kenyan farmer knows uh, that uh, the best you can manage is, uh, you know, three visits uh, per day, which means that you need to, if you cover a whole area, because if you want to make money, you want to cover a whole area, your average technical support is going to be available at best within one week. Um, so, you know, carefully selecting local agents that are willing to specialize in energy systems, among other things, uh, uh, serving competitors as well. So you, 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 there's, there's a bit of coordination to be made and able to perform first level maintenance and operate the reverse logistics, i.e. accumulate broken down devices, exchanging them and sending them back after quick testing uh, is, uh, is the best promise of a sustainable uh, service level. Uh, I, I, I've seen one of one such uh, organization work with an NGO. Uh, it does take a bit of time uh, to actually put in place. But the thing is, you can actually do uh, uh, do uh, first degree maintenance pretty cheap uh, uh, as, a, as a sort of hobby for somebody who does, I don't know, MFI distribution of uh, agricultural goods or so on and so forth. Again, I've seen that actually in operation in just one case. So uh, I would be very wary of generalizing with this. Ron, any comment on this? Uh, just to just to say that um, we see our partnership with MTN as our our logistics and and customer marketing sales and customer care uh, um, front uh, front line. Um, the way it works once the ship once the systems the containers arrive to Nigeria, it's 
on the responsibility of MTN um, through the value chain until they're in, their, in the customer's home. Uh, we definitely believe this is the most scalable well to do it. Um, just to get some sense of the numbers we're talking in Nigeria alone, uh, we estimate together with MTN marketing based on market research, uh, and MTN marketing seems to follow, is, is considered as, as a very conservative uh, estimate uh, that our potentially within MTN uh, consumer base is about seven to 10 million systems in the next uh, uh, seven years. So logistics, uh, will play a key role in so does customer care. It's, it, it, it's the example and the resemblance to the mobile phone uh, phenomenon that happened on the continent is very similar. So um, we definitely, we're very confident in, in the ability of MTN to do it. And so does to expand to other market like we've done in Cote d'Ivoire uh, a couple of months ago. Um, um, so that's, that's our approach of, of going into the market and, and Maurice? Uh, so a lot of the solar home systems companies that we see or that we work with, uh, most of them, they're very vertically integrated and do every aspect of uh, the business process. And so outsourcing uh, or breaking off components of uh, that process is um, a tricky question. And I think it really depends on what a given company sees as their kind of final form in terms of what they want to be as a company. Uh -huh. um, for many of them, I think outsourcing customer care. So like that relationship that they have with the customer after the sale is the kind of third rail that they really wouldn't want to get rid of. That's where they see their value is, is yeah. having a relationship. Um, things like logistics and uh, maintenance are spaces where there should be a stronger network of kind of third party providers that they can tap into um, that can do these. And I think that's a really great space for potential growth. Um, and we've seen companies start to um, be less uh, emphatic about having their own payment systems. So they're able to tap into uh, kind of payment system aggregators or providers. Um, and so, you know, we'll see partners using uh, groups like uh, in a couple of instances, we have MTN and Total doing logistics um, for companies. But I think the actual, uh, unless their goal is not to, you know, have a relationship with a company or with a customer after a sale, um, that customer care and engagement is really the key focus. And outsourcing that will be tough, I think. Right. Uh, I, I agree, but then if you don't outsource, you're not going to reach uh, low density areas, but which is perfectly fine for some of these companies. The, the, the last point uh, is, uh, is that in some areas which are really poor and really remote, uh, that won't be enough to actually uh, bring uh, access to, elect to electricity or access to energy. Uh, in, that, in that case, uh, what we believe is that uh, governments or donors will have to chip in. Uh, there are few examples of non-market distorting mechanisms that facilitate access to, uh, uh, to uh, remote markets while not drying up demand for high density areas. But some of the possible, possible localized support options that we have uh, seen include uh, one is result based finance which has been pretty pretty uh, um, pretty successful in some areas that is basically paying for uh, equipments that have been installed for at least 12 months in given areas so that's easy to check again against uh, that's what the Indian government did for water pumps uh, with uh, with uh, some some success the second one, uh, which uh, Hystra is ag agitating for, is uh, to have some uh, uh, utility for logistic support and, and, uh, and maintenance, i.e. investing in the multi-supplier storage distribution, level one maintenance and reverse logistic backbone. That's billing for service for the different players. So that would need uh, initial investment from donors or governments to set up but it can be run at a very low cost if it, it's able to aggregate a uh, service of different companies, uh, putting, bringing down the, the, the actual level of maintenance and reverse logistics. Uh, that's 
that's it. Uh, uh, this is, I mean, this is up your avenue, uh, Maurice. So I have you talk first about that. If you, if you have looked at, you know, donor-supported or government-supported solutions to reach really remote, really poor areas. Sure. Um, I think that we uh, yeah. feel that um, there's there's a little bit of a balance to be struck between letting the uh, market go as it's supposed to or as, as it wants to and maybe not necessarily reaching the furthest regions first um, and building up sustainable business based on more proximate customers to um, where distribution is cheaper or easier. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, I think that I agree very much that uh, if there were a focus on uh, building up cheaper distribution models and partners for companies to access and leverage uh, to reach more remote areas quicker, that would be really powerful. Um, and so we have a couple of partners that we're working with uh, in Uganda that are, you know, focusing in on just being a distributor and maintenance company and not so much on uh, the other aspects of being a, what is a solar home, a household solar home system company right now. Um, it's a very small organization at the moment. Uh, and I think that uh, we'd be interested in seeing what other ideas might exist and, and potentially supporting them. Uh, in that space, but or at least exploring what is possible in terms of uh, building up uh, a broader network of uh, distributors. Okay, Marcos, I, I know we've been late. Uh, how do you think we should handle the questions now? Yeah, uh, we got some really interesting questions. Well, first yeah, of all, like, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Francois, Maurice and Ron for this. Uh, interesting uh, discussion which really brought your uh, report to life. A um, couple of questions I got. Um, this first one to Francois. Um, the question, Google's report only tracks non-LG approved lamps being distributed by their members. Do you have any numbers for the total of non-LG approved lamps being sold? Uh, the answer is no. We have uh, some estimate um, that put the, the total uh, non-LG being sold at, uh, in terms of volume at about twice the volume of uh, uh, certified lanterns. But the, the, we're talking about very different devices at a very, and most of them have, have, are at a very low price and we don't have value. So uh, I, I, I'd be very surprised that the value of the non-certified lanterns uh, be above uh, the value of the, the certified lanterns prices. And that doesn't include SHSs because most of the SHSs are actually uh, uh, built in a bit of a haphazard way with the battery, car battery that's uh, di dying of old age, a couple of LEDs and so on. And you can't count that uh, really as, a, as, a, as an SHS being sold and you can't track that. Okay, so so your rough estimate is that the market size in total is probably twice the one yeah. That reported. Yeah, okay. mm, yeah, okay. max twice, yes. Yeah, no, I, I hope that answered that question. But the, on this sort of Lightning Global, there was an interesting discussion going on in the chat um, that addresses this issue about field resiliency and uh, yeah. quality. Um, it was stated here that the uh, Lightning Global quality standards are the most universally accepted means to test and set a minimum bar to determine off-grid product quality. Yeah. Now, the real report says the quality is still lacking. Yeah, uh, there's a difference. I, I, I mean, clearly, Lighting Global uh, has made a, a significant, significant inroads in, in guaranteeing that what you see is what you get, uh, which is very good. Uh, you know, you, you're sure if you're buying a Lighting Global lantern that it's actually going to deliver what stand, it stands for. What we contend is that for rural areas, what you see is what you get is not enough. And it's not, it's not because we decided it's not enough, because the feedback we had from those experiments of people distributing in low density rural areas is that you can't have more than 2% of your lamps coming back within the next, the first 18 months, because nobody's coming to pick them up. Uh, and, and basically they hang around, they're visible and they destroy trust in the product. So it's like it's like the Japanese when the uh, car when, car manufacturers when they invaded the U.S. market they didn't have a network 
of uh, so that it that it cars that didn't break down. That's you know, that, and that was the big push for quality, and it worked. But what you need is lanterns and SHS that don't break down and that are easy to put in place, which is unfortunately not by by uh, at least according to my interview, not the case for most lighting global suppliers. Not only a few of them. There's only a few of them that are that are actually currently past the bar. Okay. That's good. Um, there's a question for, for Lumos. Uh, you have, uh, the question is there, uh, why um, have you not been interested in the microfinance institution channel uh, as a distribution channel for your products? Well, thank you. It, it's not that we're uh, not interested in the MFI, but when we, when we thought what would be the best go-to-market strategy, uh, we felt that the mobile operator uh, would be the path of least resistance and the, and the most successful proven example to reach the, the, the millions of systems that I've alluded before. Um, we are, so, so that's a, a strategic decision that we've taken. If you take all, all of the points that we've discussed today, the pricing, the marketing, the distribution, the logistics, the uh, customer uh, support, uh, we thought that the mobile operator uh, would answer most of those uh, to the best of, of satisfaction of the consumers. Uh, so while we have been approached by MFIs and other partners, uh, uh, that's the decision we've taken. It's not to say that in very uh, strategic, uh, tactical, I'm sorry, uh, isolated ways we're not going to partner. We, we have and, and we will do that. Uh, but this would be ad hoc uh, solutions to very... Uh, idiosyncratic uh, uh, challenges within a specific market and not necessarily the uh, overall overarching strategy uh, uh, that we decided. And then a, uh, a follow-up question on this, apart from commissions, are there any other benefits which MTN gains from your partnership? MTN? MTN I think the, the beauty of our model is that uh, the, the partnership works very, very well and in a very attractive way to both uh, uh, customers. I'm not going to go into the sensitive uh, details, but obviously to be able to recruit uh, a company such as MTN, we needed to come in with a very strong value proposition uh, that would make sense to them to uh, um, go on, on and embark on, on such partnerships. Um, and the, the, the numbers uh, indicate from very early on that MTN um, see great value um, um, in, in, the, in venturing into uh, the share of wallet that their consumers are spending on energy. Uh, last uh, GSMA uh, summit, uh, which is the largest mobile operator summit uh, um, every year, taking place in Barcelona, uh, the head of MTN West Africa said that the Lubus MTN is a partner that's made in heaven. And this is the first time uh, a major telco communication such as MTN uh, has referenced the opportunity, uh, the access to energy sector has uh, uh, to them in the future. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, very good to, very good to hear. And, and I agree, you, you have to, come up with a good value proposition to them to, to uh, form that partnership. Um, but besides MTN, maybe that's a question for, for Maurice to answer. Right? Uh, one participant asking whether there's still room for local entrepreneurs to sell small lamps and Pico systems. Um, have you seen any uh, of those examples in the companies you're working with? Sure. Um, I think that there's definitely space for local companies to enter into the market, especially as uh, distributors for proven products, um, focusing on that uh, last mile or next to last mile relationship with customers uh, and sales of systems is uh there's always going to be space for local companies. Um, and as much as we've seen a growth in the solar home system market, there's still, you know, hundreds uh, in, in Nigeria alone, you know, nearly hundred million people that need uh, access to energy and that can be reached by local companies. And so um, we're doing our best to f work with companies with financial intermediaries and others that can provide 
financing to local companies that want to get started at a small scale. Um, it's uh, the, the one-to-one relationship between USAID and a small local company is sometimes too, too tough to manage. Um, but uh, our ability to work through other partners that then can ha- hold more of those relationships does exist. Um, and I think that the local company adds additional kind of value and expertise that uh, an international group or, a, a, you know, uh, a transplanting company may not have and may need to really partner and succeed in a new market. Yeah, I, I doubt that uh, actually the, I would say the playing field is much, is more and more amenable to small companies as uh, familiarity with solar expands, that people have become convinced that it's a reliable product that brings benefits. Uh, it's gonna be more and more a role of, uh, you know, local player uh, being uh, there on the field and less and less of uh, provide, supplying a superior product. Uh, so I think there's quite a lot of room for local distributors, again, to, to Maurice's points. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have more and more questions coming in, and as I said, uh, we will be answering those. There's a debate going on about the Google report. I'm sure Francois can address that issue, what's yeah. included and what's not included. Um, it brings us to the end of... Uh, actually, of I just want to correct something. Google is actually, has actually started to look at non-certified products for some time. It's just that it's actually difficult to get people get companies to send their data uh, but you do have some some view of the non-certified product volumes through uh through the through google sorry okay. about that yeah oh, we can uh, we can address that in more detail maybe in, yeah in our written response um so thank you very much uh, francois maurice and ron for these insights um, shared with us uh, we have come to the end of this webinar brought to you by the Inclusive Business Action Network, uh, Hystra, and the Practitioner Hub for Inclusive Business. Um, you can sort of review and share this webinar very shortly on the events page. Uh, we also like to invite you to join us next week to the second installment of this webinar series um, titled Scaling Up Financing. And some of you have sent in questions regarding financing, so we'll be addressing uh, those and where we look into innovative structured financing for solar companies. So join us on the 27th um, at the different times indicated here in the slides. Um, of course, uh, we'd like to hear your feedback. Um, tell us what you think um, so we can improve on our offering to you. And of course, um, join the Practitioner Hub. Uh, you probably joined already because you've signed up uh, and got the message, but share the news. Uh, this is a great place for resources, insights, and discussions on inclusive business. Um, again, uh, thank you, Maurice, uh, Francois, and Ron uh, to be on this call uh, today. I also like to thank my colleague uh, Carolina and Anne from the Practitioner Hub uh, for setting it all up. It's now th- three o'clock and we'll be closing this webinar on time. Bravo. Thank you very much. Thank you.